Hello, everyone. Um, this is going to be a, this is a, not a super polished talk. This is going to be a little bit of an informal um, demo and question and answer and show some stuff, um, show some stuff in progress, show how far it's come along, and take a little peek under the hood to show how some of these things work. So, uh, my topic tonight is uh, Embroider, which is a next generation build system for Ember apps. And uh, it is basically, um, it, it's, it plugs in inside of Ember CLI. It doesn't, we don't throw away Ember CLI or anything like that. We have a ton of good tooling around that that we want to keep. Um, but mostly, but the, the part of Ember CLI that is the build pipeline, it replaces. So this is the Embroider repo. It's a mono repo. It has a ton of packages in it. Well, not a ton, but a bunch, uh, six right now. Um, and uh, there is a readme here that goes through the high level of what Embroider is. And there's some instructions on how to try it out. Um, what I want to point to is the, there's also the, a document here called Spec, and um, it shares a bit of motivation in a, hopefully not too many words. Uh, the goal here is to it, it, uh, there's a pattern we've, we've done successfully multiple times in Ember, which is build up a, a whole base of features by like solving really users' problems, right? Solving, making it possible to build apps, adding features to the framework. And then once we've done that and got a ton of feedback from the community, you realize that you've now accumulated features. And um, there's a real opportunity to kind of look for the common threads in all of those disparate features and come up with a new core primitive that's got really good abstractions that you can re-implement the system around. And then that tends to unlock better experimentation, better innovation, better performance, things like that. A, a great example of this is the Glimmer rendering engine itself, which you know we have now gone through multiple generations of the core rendering system under Ember. Um, the current one, Glimmer Glimmer Two, is you know a very nice core that has extremely nice primitives that are that the rest of Ember has been re-implemented on top of. And because we did it in that layered way, um, we we get to bring the whole community along. You know, for the most part, we have been able to keep smooth upgrade paths from at least very early in the 2.0 series all the way up through today. Right? So, And that really comes down to being able to implement the new, cool, powerful abstractions as a, uh, as a basically write them the way you want to write them. Make the, the nice, shiny, pure, cool thing, right? the, the kernel of functionality. But then do the work to re-implement the existing system on top of those new primitives. And that's what lets you bring everybody along. And... Um, what unlocks a lot of the kind of community sharing and, you know, the value of the Ember ecosystem, a lot of it comes down to the fact that there's a ton of add-ons out there. There's teams that have many, many, many apps and they're able to jump from one app to the other and know what they're getting into, even though those apps span quite a few versions. And so, like, the idea that we would come up with a new build system for Ember that is not backward compatible is just not acceptable, right? We would bifurcate the community. We'd spread so much of that effort around. And so... um the challenge is to make a fully backward compatible build system that can do the new modern things we wanted to do. And so what that comes down to is a, a few key ideas, ideas. One is fully embracing ES modules, meaning ECMAScript modules, right? The, the, the modules that are now built into JavaScript, import and export and all that. Um, we adopted those as an authoring syntax very early, um, even before they were finalized as in the language. Um, and Ember people were involved in the, the standardization process of making sure they would be a good module structure that could meet the needs of a project like Ember. Um, so we've been authoring them for a long time, um, but we haven't really fully taken advantage of them, of their semantics within our build system. And so that is one of the kind of key points in Embroider. Um, a thing that ES modules doesn't have an opinion about is it's, it, it's very precise about the semantics of what import and export mean and how mo when modules should run and things like that. Um, and what's the difference between a default export and named exports and all those things that are in the spec. But it doesn't have a lot of opinion about the actual meaning of the stuff that goes inside the string when you type import from some string. Uh, the spec doesn't say much about that. That's really considered a platform concern, a loader concern. Um, and so, the, however, the dominant way that those are interpreted is basically following what Node and NPM do and mostly that's just the consequence of Node and NPM becoming the most popular, biggest ecosystem of, pa of shared packages. And um, so tooling tends to understand how it works. And so 
um, the node modules resolution algorithm for how do you take a, a, the name of a package and some file in it or whatever and resolve that down to which file it is tends to be the kind of ecosystem wide dominant way to think about it. And it, and even though it is not a, uh, ideal spec or ideal algorithm, like there's a lot of things that are bad about node modules resolution algorithm. Um, it is the one that works with the most stuff. And also there's people working very hard on making it not bad. Also things like yarn plug and play are very nice and can be dropped in, drop in replacements for it. So anyway, that's the second piece here. Play nice with NPM conventions is really about deciding on a semantics for what, what it means to import a thing and sticking to it. Um, and so these two things, the first points together, fully embracing ES modules and playing nice with NPM conventions together, they imply a bunch of stuff about invariance that should always be true. Whenever you have something that says import from blah, um, that has a very precise meaning and it should work no matter where you say it. Right. And once you have an invariant like that, uh, it makes your whole system much more easy to understand. And it makes both for humans and for tooling, like your editor or TypeScript or SAS or, um, or also an optimizing compiler that wants to take, that wants to take a, a global view of your application and figure out what parts to ship to the browser when, or which parts never to ship to the browser because they're not needed. So that becomes the goal. And so the kind of, the kind of how do we get there is, um, a multi-stage compiler. So because we have a lot of existing code, we have a lot of add-ons, we have a lot of apps, and our saving grace really is that we adopted the very static, very declarative ES module authoring syntax very early. And so the vast majority of code out in Ember, Ember world is written as modules, right? and modules are very introspectable. Like we can parse them, we can see what they import, we can see what they export, and we can very um, very precisely manipulate those relationships to align things. So the idea of Embroider is that we, we're going to be able to take existing code, run it through compilation paths that, that gets rid of quirkiness in our module semantics and gets us aligned with this world where everything's, everything's modules and all the module resolution follows the node modules resolution rules. And once you get into that path, that point, from there forward, it's much easier to work with because now you have a system where imports all mean the same thing everywhere. So we basically compile ourselves into that point and then to move forward is, is much easier. So, so what we have is a three stage compiler and rather than go into super detail on that yet, I think I'm going to start first with a demo. Um, and we can then, um, kind of then come back around to talk about the architecture and how it actually works. So I'm going to use super rentals, which is, uh, if you use, if you check out the Ember tutorial right on in the guides, the actual getting started tutorial, um, it's, it's built around the super rentals app. If you haven't seen it, um, this is the super rentals repo in the Ember learn organization. It's a pretty simple app. It's not like a challenging case here for embroider. Um, I, we are testing embroider against big complicated apps and it, it works out there too. A lot of the time, um, but this was a good one that we could do in the scope of, of this short time we have together here. Um, so this is what it, what it looks like. Um, it's like got little property list, property rental listings. We can go to individual ones. We have an about page and a contact page. And that's pretty much it. I mean, there's like a little filtering feature here. Stuff like that. Uh, and it's, it's embedding maps. All right. So it's a nice little demo app that teaches a lot of the moving parts of an Ember app. And it does have a test suite. So we can see that test path. And it's got like some acceptance tests and some integration tests and a lot of lints and stuff. Um, so that's super rentals. It's boring and, and that's the point. Um, so we're going to switch it to building with Embroider. Um, so, uh, we're going to start in the, well, let's, we're start by adding some packages actually. Um, and I'm going to do this manually just because uh, I don't want to, um, I'm going to link them all locally because I don't want to wait for you, like NPM installing while we're on the thing. Um, so I'm going to add manually, but you know, you would normally go npm install or yarn install some packages. And I'm going to add, um, it's three packages we need and they correspond to the three stages of the build, which is why they're three separate packages. Um, they're embroidered compact core and web pack. 
And these correspond to the three stages because the first stage is all about taking everything that's out there in the wild west of existing add-ons. And this is mostly talking about add-ons. Um, we can get into why. But the wild west of what add-ons can do um, and compiling them into a new clear standard for what an add-on should do uh, in a very declarative, in a, in a much more declarative way, in statically analyzable way. And then core is written as the second stage. It, it assumes that all the, all the inputs you give it are nicely formatted V2 packages that are in this new clean spec. So core is easier to write because it doesn't have to deal with all of the compatibility stuff that Compat already compiled out for us. Uh, this is the value of a multi-stage compiler. And then the third stage um, is intended to be um, pluggable. Um, and so the one we've been working with so far is, what is a Webpack-based uh, final end. Um, but the intent is that we're not going to lock into the semantics of Webpack, and we're going to be able to basically... If somebody wants, to, anybody who wants to try out a new new contender, somebody thinks they've got a thing that's better. Maybe it's Parcel JS, maybe it's Rollup, maybe it's something that hasn't been written yet that's actually written, going to be written in Rust and be super fast. Right? Any of those things that don't know anything about Ember but know about packaging JavaScript, we want, that's what can go in this stage. And so the difference between core and the second stage and this Webpack stage is that the core stage takes an Ember app that knows about Ember conventions. So it knows what an engine is. It knows what routes are and how they're laid out. Um, it knows about templates and how they get compiled. It knows all that stuff. And it compiles that into something that is just, you have to, to the third stage doesn't need to know anything about any Ember stuff. All it needs to know is the HTML spec, the JavaScript spec, and that's it. So a tool that is made generically to package up web applications can do the third stage for us. And the, so that lets us unlock the capability of taking advantage of all the massive investment that other people have made in that kind of tooling and pick and choose from the best things out there. So that's the three stages. Um, so I'm going to add those to Super Rentals here, and I'm going to um, link them in locally because I, I have them already checked out locally where I've been developing them. I'm running against the master version of Embroider. Um, if you want to follow along at home, that's what I'm using. I should probably cut a release because we've had a bunch of bug fixes in and there's not a released version with all of the latest bug fixes. Um, it's moving pretty fast. So I've added these packages. That's what I'm doing magically by itself. I need to come into the Ember CLI build JS for my add-on and uh, I'm going to grab in the embroider instructions here in the embroider repo in the readme. It says how to try it. And it, this is the step I did first. I added these dependencies. And then in my Ember CI build, I'm supposed to make this edit. So instead of returning app to tree, I'm going to do a different thing. And we'll just grab this code. And a thing I actually like to do is instead of deleting the classic app is to um, create a flag that lets you still use it so you can switch back and forth really easily. Um, being able to do this is really nice because it means... Um, you don't have to, there's not like a, when do I pull the trigger on putting embroider into my app? You can just make it a feature flag. Um, and the, the point would be that hopefully everything in your app works the same in the classic app and in the embroider app. And if, if anything, just the embroider app happens to run nicer because it gets some new, some new optimizations when we build it. But the semantics of it should be same. Like correctness should be maintained. So it should be easy to flip a switch and try it. So you can see all we're really doing is, um, we're configuring the stages, the, Compat build is just, it's, it's a kind of pre, pre-configured pipeline of the three stages for us where you have to tell it what the third stage is going to be. That's why we kind of import our third stage and pass it in. Um, and so that's enough to try it out. So let's now, um, go back to our app and build it. And I haven't done anything to this app. Uh, it really is stock. I have one little commit I made locally just because, just to, um, get rid of an annoying warning, but it didn't actually break anything. I upgraded template lint. Um, and so is the thought there, Ed, that at some point, once all of the add-ons are like compatible with this new style, you could have, you could just change that method there to, to like remove the compatibility layer and just go straight to, straight to the metal. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yes. And in a, in a world where everything was already written in the native, native V2 uh, spec format, the compatibility layer gets to go away. Or at least do very little. Um, I mean, we're far enough from that that it's not a very actively tried case, right? Like, um, but it's designed for that. Yes. Um, before we can get there, there's definitely steps, right? Um, like multiple, um, 
basically the thing we're getting close to now is being able to do the thing I'm showing where you have a lot of compatibility layer go stuff going on. Um, and like, which allows us to start then gradually converting new things, right? Um, we can't really start converting new things until we've got some RSCs to stabilize all these interfaces, right? It's the, the V2 spec is a draft right now. Um, we really need to start shipping the RFCs that'll formalize it. And at that point, add-on authors can actually start publishing their stuff to NPM in the new format, um, which for many add-ons won't actually require a lot of work, um, but that's a digression that and we can go into. Theoretically, would you have to also have a compatibility layer going the other way if add-ons start going to like yes. your version? And then... Correct. Yes. Uh, Yes, and it's designed so that should work. So the V2 add-on spec uh, is basically very restrict. It's much more restrictive than what um, add-ons can do today. So today, um, add-ons, when they're providing code to the build, um, they don't just like have a folder full of code. I mean, that's the they they do. They can, that's the thing they can do. But that's just it happens to be the default behavior in general. What that they do is they're like they're a full program that runs and generates code to put in your build, right? And because it's a full Turing compute, complete program in there that can't be analyzed from the outside, it's really impossible to look at an add-on, uh, most add-ons, or at least all add-ons, and know what's going to come out of there. And it's certainly impossible for, say, your editor or TypeScript or SAS to know where the files come from today, right? Because they'd have to, you have to run the program to know what comes out, right? You have to run the Barclay pipeline inside of each of the add-ons. So today's add-ons are very powerful in that way. Um, the, the point of the V2 spec is to find a narrower path for them where they don't have that general purpose power, but we find we have, we give them well targeted replacements for the powerful things they would have wanted to do. And so, um, because V2 packages are then simpler and less powerful, polyfilling them back to work in classic builds is not very hard. Um, cause they're basically getting less powerful, not more. The, the, there are a couple ways in which they get more powerful. And the main one is that, um, being able to import directly from NPM is just a, base feature that's always supported under Embroider, um, which is why we have Ember Auto Import, however, because that is the polyfill for Embroider. So an add-on can today use Ember Auto Import and import things straight from NPM, uh, even in a classic build. And then under Embroider, that's just the native behavior. Auto Import serves only as a kind of opt-in that you know you're getting things in from NPM, and Embroider handles them natively for you. So um, our thing built, and it's a little bit noisy in the output, mostly because, like, stuff is still new and it's kind of better to see all the details rather than trying to make it quiet so far. Um, most of what we're seeing is um, spew out of Webpack and Webpack likes to be kind of loud and it likes to, it also likes to try to, um, Webpack engages in fat shaming basically. If it any, sees anything in your app that seems too big, it's like, you need to make your app smaller. Uh, I don't necessarily agree. It's very context dependent. What's too big? Um, this one didn't do it. It's fine. But um so this is some spew from Webpack. An interesting thing we're going to look at later is where it's at the beginning when we say building into, um, this is where the output of, when we take our existing Ember app and we're going to compile it into a kind of web standards thing that has all of the Emberisms compiled away, this is where it's going to go. So we're going to look in there in a bit. Um, and lastly, these warnings here are, they're legit. Um, they're examples of things that... Um, are actually broken code floating around in popular Ember add-ons that um, they don't cause the app to break, but they're just like vestigial appendages of code that normally you don't notice are bad. Um, but because we're now doing much more static analysis, we notice that there's problems. So for example, um, like this code in Ember test helpers tries to re-export a thing that doesn't exist. And that will blow up if you try to use it, but apparently nobody tries to use it because nobody's noticed that the adult code is still there. So you see warnings like this. Um, a, a nice way to help out is if you try out Embroider and you see some of these warnings, go PR the libraries and make them not do those warnings anymore. Um, basically, things are, we're now really actually following the ES module spec, and that, that has implication, implications like this. Um, we find cases where there's actually invalid JavaScript that accidentally worked under the, under the traditional way Ember apps build, but now it actually needs to be real modules. Anyway, that was the build, uh, and the app runs, and it looks exactly the same. And that's the intention, of course. Um, and um, so, it, I mean, it looks exactly the same. It works the same. All those features are there. Our add-on that does maps is there. Um, and I didn't have to do anything uh, to this app to make it work. So, like, Embroider was already enough to handle this case, which is great. It's not a super hard case, but it's got. if you think about the number of add-ons, even in a kind of stock build, Quite a lot of stuff. Um, 
So I was pleasantly happy that it all worked on the first try. And um, to see if something a little different about like what is going on in here, uh, if we look first at our um, our HTML, we've got this is probably too small for you, huh? We've got um, our JavaScript is now split actually into it's like chunks, um, and this is one of the things about switching to Embroider. It's deliberate that you don't really get a say anymore into as, as far as like which of your modules goes into which actual JavaScript file is going to go out on the network. That decision is left up to the optimizing stage three, meaning Webpack in this case. And by by giving it that freedom, it gets to split things up in whatever way it thinks is optimal, right? And that could mean um, a bunch of different things, right? Um, I think the reason we've got, uh, I don't know exactly why we have a three right now in here, um, but that's what that this is inside to make. It's all very tweakable. We're going to want to tweak good default settings for every app. Um, but so initially, um, when you when you want to try Embroider, the first step is to do what we just did, turn it on and see if it works. And what doesn't work, you know, debug and file bugs and all that. Once you get this far, um, it's time to start turning on some more options because the out of the box behavior for Embroider is intended to be maximal compatibility, meaning like. We're going to try to do everything we can to behave close to the traditional Ember CLI. It's not perfect. There's certain things that are just a bridge too far for us to do. Like, we're not going to make invalid ES modules actually valid. We can't necessarily do that. Um, and if something, if you're doing something extremely dynamic, um, that we can't detect, like, you know, there's cases we can't handle. But the vast majority of what add-ons and apps do, um, does actually work in this mode. So the next thing we're going to turn on are a couple of other features. Um, Static add-on test support trees, static add-on trees. Um, so add-ons can expose, they expose you know, their own files, we already said, in their add-on tree. And there's also test support ones, which are, as they sound, just like the files the add-on has for tests. By default, Embroider does the same thing that Ember does, uh, Ember CLI normally does, which is if it's every file that sees in an add-on, if it's there, it goes in your build. Right? They all get pushed into the build. We have explicit compatibility code inverter to make that happen. Um, but when you opt into making those trees static, like we do here, we do not push them all into the build. And um, so when you're testing out inverter in an app, the next we, the, that is basically the next stage to try, is you, you can turn all those trees into static and you see if anything breaks. Um, the kind of things that would break here is if people are doing very dynamic uses at runtime where they try to require some file, and we couldn't see that that file was going to get required, it won't actually be in the build. It'll be missing. Because now we're actually trusting that we're going to statically find all the things in that tree. Now, it turns out it doesn't break super rentals. Everything works great. Um, and the test paths do, um, which we should also show. Um, but um, this is the next stage. And I'm showing the steps in order because I think it is useful if people are going to follow along and do this on apps. Uh, even though in this case we didn't find any interesting breakage at this stage. I'm also going to, if we have time, go back under the hood and show you what actually happens when we turn on these options because I think it's illustrative to show how, we, how we're compiling the Ember app into uh, a much more static thing as we add these options. So then um, it would be kind of... Oh, and that's the test while passing. Um, it would be kind of fun to show if there's any stuff that's getting shaken out. Um, it's a little hard to prove just by looking at the app, of course. And in an app this small, it might not be obvious what's coming in and what's coming out. Um, I think I will not um, try to do that live, like debug the set of helpers and stuff like that. But so I, I know there's a few things even in the default Ember app that shake out when you get even just to get to this level. So once you turn these options on, for example, um, unused mix-ins in things like, like there's some in Ember data, um, they won't be in your app anymore. They're gone. Right, because it's just a file that gets imported from an actual add-ons namespace, and if nobody imports it, it won't be in the app. So that's what you get with these turned on. Um, they're very close to always safe. Um, they're not the default because they're not 100% always safe because, like I said, people do in add-ons, people do dynamic things sometimes. Um, but the reason they're mostly safe is if you think about how apps and add-ons work, almost everything that is in the add-on trees gets imported from somewhere, um, either from... Um, the re-exports in the app tree that is the traditional thing uh, to do, or just like features that are exposed into the app that you actually import from the add-on, right? As long as you import it from the add-on by writing import, that it's covered. 
so that case is good. Um, the next thing is to turn on static helpers. And static helpers is also almost always safe. Um, this is going to actually statically, like basically, just, it's, gonna, it's no longer going to force every possible helper into the app. Instead, it's only going to put them in the app if something pulls them into the app. So um, this, ten, this turns out to be basically almost 100, as far as I can tell, 100% safe because there's not really a more dynamic way to get help, helpers. There's no, for components, we have the component helper, which can very dynamically pick a component, like an eval. For helpers, we don't have a helper helper. So there's actually, actually tends to be very safe to statically analyze all of them, and you very rarely have a problem. Uh, and then I'm also going to turn on static components. Static components is really kind of like the um, the hump. If you can get over this, like with your app, you've now like got basically everything statically analyzed. Um, I say everything, everything that Embroider is currently capable of doing, which is um, all your help, everything in the templates, all your templates, helpers, components. Um, are all actually statically analyzed as a graph. And so unused components, not in your app. Right? If you, uh, once you turn on static helpers, if you add something, uh, help, add a library like Ember Truth Helpers or Ember Composable Helpers, right? those tend to be very useful utility libraries that have dozens of different helpers in them. If you only use two, this makes sure you only get those two in your app um, just by turning on static helpers. Um, and static components similarly, right? If you have an add-on that provides a ton of components, um, you're going to just get the ones that are used, which is great. Um, now, static components is more challenging uh, in general. We got lucky here, and Super Rentals, I think, actually doesn't hit any of the hard cases. But the hard cases are mostly where you have things like the, the, the dynamic component helper, and we can't tell where a component invocation is coming from. Um, we could probably um, work through some examples of that if, we, if there's time to show you what it looks like. Um, basically, Embroider has a, it, it does try to find where there's holes in the static analysis like that, and it'll say, I see there's a dynamic component invocation here. I don't know where it's coming from. You've got to account for it somehow. And then there is a rules system that you can basically apply rules and say, okay, I know that that one really comes from over here. It's accounted for, uh, to take the, make the warning go away. Or when you make, and when you say that, it sometimes it actually, like, explicitly, there's ways in the rules to explicitly say, um, uh, that component actually comes from over here. So over there, uh, whatever component it's referring to had better get pulled into the build, things like that. So there's a kind of ride-along rule system for trying to close the legacy um, cases. And not just legacy. There's really no design for how not to do some of these dynamic things in Ember yet. Not until Ember has, in the framework, um, like we, f we actually ship things like template imports and um, stuff like that. Until we do, there's no, there's no better way to do these things. And so we really need a rule system to close these holes in Embroider if you have dynamic stuff in your app. Um, so anyway, Super Rentals, again, very boringly actually all just works uh, with static static components. And um, that's good, right? Uh, it means now that no unused components or helpers from our add-ons are in the app anymore. Um, this, this turns out to be a very boring demo when it all works, actually, right? Um, which I guess is good. Uh, and so now, once you have these four turned on, you can get to the coolest level, which is now we could turn on the route splitting because um, now the only reason anything in our templates, anything in our templates, uh, yeah, which is, you know, helpers and components, and then the things that they pull on out of the add-on trees, the only reason anything gets into the build now is if it's actually getting used by something. And so it's the routes that actually pull on, uh, like the entry points that pull on all these files. So we can now relatively easily choose what, where to split things up. So um, this app, of course, is very small. It has only a few routes. But if we wanted, for example, to take um, about and contact and split them off so they don't load when you first visit the, the uh, app, right? we can do this. And those become split points. Any of their children will be with them until unless you get to another split point. Um, so we'll start the build again with that option. This is supposed to work. It does usually work. It worked when I just tried it. I uh, wonder why. Oh, I know why. I know why. I missed a step. In fact, you can see that my app is actually broken when I go into the split routes. When I go to about, there's no about page. Uh, it didn't load the code because it didn't load the code. And the about is now blank. Uh, so it's contact. Um, they're empty routes right now because I didn't follow all the steps. Um, to turn on the route splitting, there is one other thing we need to do to our app, um, and it's small, but it's important. So um, we need to add another package. It is Embroider Router. 
And I'm going to also link that in Darn link embroider router. So you would normally npm install embroider router. And then uh, in our router JS, all we need to change is embroider router. We just have to import the embroider router instead of the standard Ember one. And it changes almost nothing. All it really does is one tiny little patch to hook into knowing when we're about to change routes um, and triggering the load of the code for that route if we haven't already got it. So let's try again. Build performance is quite competitive with Ember CLI. Um, for a lot of loads, it's actually faster already, even with the full compatibility system on. It does depend a little bit on the specifics of your app. Um, also, um, Ember CLI still wins out on a few of the hot cache cases where it's got like on-disk persistent caches that um, can be faster than some of what we have. On cold boot, Ember is already faster, tends to be, with uh, even with the full compatibility system turned on. And rebuilds are competitive, if not faster. And um, and if you turn the compatibility system off, like if you assume that future world where, where all or at least most, if, if at least most of your add-ons were published natively in V2, it really it screams it's very fast because um, there's a lot less work to do at app build time. We push a lot of that complexity off to add-on publication time. Um, so anyway, let's see. Okay, now it's not broken anymore. So now let's come in at the home page and clear our network tab and switch to our about page. Oh, and I had a breakpoint in here because I was debugging it earlier. There we go. Um, it loaded that JavaScript when we, at, at the route transition for that route. Uh, you can actually see, you can actually see here somewhat interestingly what that, what it chose to load. Uh, it needed the, so there's an actual entry point for the route that we've synthesized. Like there's a JavaScript file that we synthesized that requires and defines all the things that are needed, including like the route file, the template file, and well, this one is very simple. All it needed was that. But if this if this template used components, and they used components, and they used helpers, etc., all that gets pulled in correctly. And if some of them were already in the build, of course, they don't get pulled in again. We know about the whole graph globally, right? So very cool and exciting stuff. You definitely don't want to overfetch JavaScript by too much. Like you don't want to get a lot of extra stuff. But you also don't want to have to make a million different network requests, right? And that is the trade-off um, that the optimizing optimizer has to make. Now, um, the nice thing about the embroider architecture is it doesn't have any opinion about how that optimization happens. Right now, it's actually just using Webpack's default, um, which have there's quite a bit of policy in there that you can play with. Um, for example, it, it has... So it, it can split at any boundary where we've said that it's possible to split. So when you when you actually declare route splitting, um, we could take a look at what that compiles to, but it basically compiles to a dynamic import statement in the code. And that is an opportunity for the code to be split at that point. Uh, it's not an obligation, however. So you can, um, in the optimizer, in like, in, for example, in Webpack's optimizer, you can say, uh, you can set a limit for how small is a reasonable, like, at what point is the bundle so small it's not really worth a separate network request? Like, just inline it wherever it's needed, right? Um, also, you know, like, how many network requests do you consider is reasonable for one page? If you think if you think four is fine, that gives it a much more many different ways to slice and dice the components into smaller chunks. Um, so the nice thing, so basically my answer is uh, the answer is flexible because optimizations like there's different ways to turn the knob. Um, we could do some experience. We could try out an example and see where it chooses to put things. Sometimes you will get components twice. Sometimes you will get a separate bundle split out for them. Um, that's also one reason why even at the entry point of the app, um, you don't necessarily know how many JavaScript files are going to be in your index.html. One reason for that is that if there's a lot of, if there's stuff that's commonly shared by a bunch of different routes, um, it's going to go into its own chunk, a common chunk. And then maybe you need it on your home page, so it's going to be in there, right? Um, but if you enter it on another page, it would get loaded dynamically. So stuff like that um, is why we really try to build the system around not having, not locking in any opinions about exactly how many files are needed for any particular thing. Like the code in the um, in the router, the embroider router that loads what you need for a route doesn't. It doesn't. That code doesn't have to know whether the route actually is split across two JavaScript files on the server. One JavaScript file on the server, 
seven JavaScript files on the server, which would be weird and probably too many, but like, you know, our, it doesn't care. Right? Like we just get to express the intention that I need this stuff and then leave it up to the optimizer. So that's the, that's the slightly slippery, but slippery answer, which I think has to be a slippery answer because there's just not one best answer. And, um, part of the point of this is to make it easy now. Like once after all using Embroider, it's much easier to, when somebody says, Hey, I think I have a better JavaScript bundle that optimizes better. You can drop it in, right? Not with like a trivial amount of work, but a pretty small amount of work. You can drop it in and then, um, you know, see if on real apps, does it really optimize better? What is the impact on real user experience? Right. Which is, which is what matters at the end of the day. It's very hard to make these kind of optimization decisions just based off of abstract metrics, like byte size by itself is not always the interesting metric, right? Number of network requests matters too, but like the interesting met met metric is really what is it, how does it behave for your typical users, right? So, um, we just have to get real data on that stuff. We can only split stuff that is splittable, right? So if you have a lot of heavy dependencies that are used everywhere, they can't be split. And so um, it's not like waving a magic wand and getting a massive performance boost. What is really more about, though, is unlocking the path to let people actually make their performance better. Up until now, it was very hard. Like, there's not really an incentive to do things one way versus another when today in Ember apps, for example, there's not really a convenient way if you're implementing some add-on that um, has, gives people a component and that component uses some third-party library, right? There's not an easy way today to, um, like, do the right thing so that that third-party library only loads when your component is rendered, right? Like, you can do it, but it's very obnoxious, right? And it would probably make the, your component harder to use because it's just not baked into the system. But with a system like this, um, you can make those behaviors be very much the default, right? And, like, the easiest way to do things would also be the fast one. Like, if you actually just do an import from NPM of that third-party library into your component, you, that third-party library will now only load when your component is needed. And so if your component's off on some other route and it's not needed on the home page, that whole third-party library gets out of the, the, the initial page load, right? That stuff is huge. And a lot of it um, is going to be like a long series of little wins as add-ons begin to take advantage of this and app authors begin to take advantage of this. It's just that like right now, most existing apps didn't, do that work because there wasn't a reason before, up till now to do that work, right? But so this unblocks it. And so um, you tend to get modest gains. Like it, it should absolutely, your app should be smaller and not bigger on a rotor for sure. Um, at least certainly when you get any of the, like it's certainly, certainly by the time you get to where we got to with this one, when we turned on all the way up to the four settings we started with, uh, static things, right? By the time you have that, your app should absolutely not be bigger. Um, and def And it should hopefully be smaller. You know, maybe not mind blowingly smaller, but smaller, and it should run at least as fast, right? Um, so, and then, you know, especially if your app tends to grow large horizontally in terms of having many different routes with a lot of different functionality, then you will really get start to benefit from the route splitting stuff. Um, you're gonna, you know, if you've got, you've got some analytics page that loads a ton of analytics and graphing libraries and stuff like that, you can get that out of your initial page load, it would be great, right? And doing that in a way that's not hacky. Um, and doing that in a way that today, you know, sometimes if people needed lazy loading, there was kind of two paths. One was to do something very ad hoc, which you could do. And if you know the system and you're kind of careful, you'd make it all work. Um, and the other is to use Ember engines, which can be lazy. But that opts you into a lot of behaviors that you might not really want because it was, it's designed for use cases, not just lazy loading. Like it does that, but it's also designed for trying to deliberately isolate multiple teams who are trying to all share one Ember app in a very big organization. And if you're not that, if that's not your organization, engines can feel very frustrating because there's a lot of deliberate isolation between your code on one side of the boundary and what your code on the other. It would be very frustrating if it's all one team. So today people often just didn't do the work because it wasn't worth it. And so now like we want to make it even, e we want to make it the easiest way to do it is also the way that's fastest and most splittable um, so that your app can grow and grow and grow features and never get a bigger payload size, right? Because like the people who don't use the feature won't get the code. The upstream tool that Broccoli Concat Analyzer was based off of works here. Um, and I actually just got a great PR uh, just like this yesterday, maybe today, uh, somebody documenting this for us. Let me give them credit. I want to make sure I get the right person. 
Ah, uh, yes, here we go. Shout out to EFX um, because uh, they just documented this for us. So now there's instructions in here about how to run the analyzer. And so um, there's a there's a readme in the readme link to this file that tells you how to do it. So yes, you basically install the bundle analyzer plugin, and it has the same UI you've seen in the Broccoli one, only it'll cover all the webpack things. And it'll tell you what's in each of the bundles and stuff like that. Um, it is, it's pretty nice, yeah. Um, we could even probably do that right now if, if we want to, as like with the remaining time we have. Um, there, and this file also goes into the one, one caveat, which is there is some of our stuff that doesn't go through stage three, like some legacy stuff. So like your vendor JS files, um, because they're very script oriented. And so all JavaScript is either in a script context or a module context, and they're really not the same thing. They have different semantics. Uh, if you confuse the two, things break. Um, everything in our traditional vendor JS is script context stuff, not module context stuff. And um, Webpack in particular is really bad at that. Like it's very module oriented. Uh, it has hacks to do script context stuff that aren't really nice. So we don't even run. We just basically don't run that stuff through the stage three. So your vendor JS tends to get traditional stuff in it. Uh, it gets smaller when you go to inverter because vendor JS today has a lot of stuff that gets added by add-ons as scripts, and we still need those. But it also has all of the tree for app stuff out of all of your add-ons. And um, that we don't, that actually goes through um, Webpack now and will get shaken out and stuff. So your render JS gets smaller when you adopt Inverter, but you still have one and it still has a lot of the classic stuff like Ember and jQuery. And if you have jQuery and the loader and all that stuff is still in there. Uh, and anyway, the reason I brought that up is because that stuff doesn't go through Webpack. So you don't see it in the bundle analyzer. So there is a separate way to get Inverter to dump those stats for you. So that's documented in the repo as the analyzing file, yeah. Um, but I agree, those kind of tools are pretty critical once you have this kind of very dynamically optimizable stuff. Um, you need to, you definitely need tools like that to get a holistic view of what, where size, where is stuff coming from, where is it, and like what, why did my app, why is my app bigger today than it was a month ago? What did I put in that did that? Yeah, so you know, if you if you know what goes in Ember CLI build, um, this is like what we're returning is what 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 you have to return from Ember CLI build is a broccoli tree. That's what this is. Like Compact build returns a broccoli tree, um, and so you know we are definitely still using broccoli. Bro what broccoli is good at is gluing together build stages. Um, it isn't like it's not the build stage. Like it, the tools that you put inside of it are really what give you the magic of like compile all the things. Um, but Broccoli is really an good as an orchestration layer for gluing together build tools. So it's actually quite a good fit for what we're doing here. The main difference um, is going to be that, um, well, a lot of things that today would have forced an add-on author to write custom Broccoli code, they won't have to anymore. Um, mostly because um, like, we want to get away from that pattern anyway. Like Just emitting arbitrary, running arbitrary code to decide what your JavaScript even is makes your app very hard to analyze, right? So a lot of places where you might have been forced to write some custom broccoli code before, you will not be obligated to do so anymore, and you'll be even discouraged from doing so. Um, so it basically kind of probably pushes broccoli down into more infrastructural layer, more so than it is now. I mean, it's already kind of arcane and it's somewhat of a barrier to people contributing, right? Um, not be, and I, that's not, I'm not saying it's bad, actually. I like it a lot uh, for its use as an infrastructure. Um, it is a little mind bendy because it's very much a flow-oriented programming language. And if you haven't ever done that before, it's very confusing. Um, so, but it's in there, and it's still important. And, uh, and, even, and it's not that you won't ever need it, either. Like, if you want to, if you're implementing a new kind of preprocessor or anything like that, um, or even if you're an add-on author and you want to do something custom, you can still use Broccoli to implement that stuff. It's just that add-ons are going to have to, if, once they go to a new format, they're going to have to run their custom Broccoli pipelines before they publish to NPM, not inside of the app. Um, so it still makes total sense to have them. And a lot, and basically custom code that add-ons have already written can still work, uh, as long as, with a few caveats. Um, but, um, Basically, we're not going to let V2 add-ons run custom code inside of the app anymore. They've got to, if they can run it, but they got to run it before they publish to NPM, um, which does change some of the things they're going to do, right? They're not going to be able to, um, like, include different code based on their config or based on the Ember version. So then the question is, well, like, how do you meet those needs? Uh, the answer to that is we have a macro system. So we're going to give add-on authors 
standardized compile time macros that they can use in their code. Kind of similar to how you know we have we have a macro like HBS backticks for doing inline templates, right? It's a thing that is valid JavaScript, but we actually evaluate it at build time and not at runtime. So that's why I'm calling it a macro. And we want to have a standardized macro system. The first version of that is all implemented already and is documented in the repo here. There's an embroider macros package um, where you can basically have a macro that says, you know, like, you know, if the Ember version is less than whatever, use this code, otherwise use this code. And then at compile time, embroider guarantees that we're going to strip out the dead branch. Right. So that's how add-on authors can still optimize for different situations, different configs, different versions without, um, without having to run arbitrary broccoli code to generate different source code. Like the source code is all there. It's just on disk. We see it all, all the time. But Babel can then, through this macro system, compile out the pieces that are not needed. So that's a kind of, that's all to answer the kind of question of what, you know, what are we replacing? Well, what would, the things you used to use custom Rockly code to do that you won't need to anymore. You can use those that stuff instead. And honestly, those things are nicer, hopefully a nicer API anyway, right? To be able to write a conditional in your source code that just says, you know, it's like feature, if you've seen the feature flags inside of Ember or Ember compatibility helpers add on, those are both examples of the same kind of idea. Um, the goal is just that we do need to stabilize one very small core of macro functionality because it needs to be stable across uh, a bunch of different, uh, it needs to be stable long term because add-ons are going to publish to NPM relying on those macros and they don't get to bring their own version of the macros along. The macros are baked into Embraer. So we want to have a very stable base, basically consider them part of the language, right? Um, a lot of the thinking that goes into the Embraer spec is um, really trying to think about this in terms of defining as much of the semantics of the system as we can in terms of very stable specifications, as in like HTML is a good standard and ES whatever is a good standard because they're already codified standards. And just like follow that as much as we can for every feature so that the code that we ship is like valid and under and remains valid far into the future. So there's a, there's some like kind of debuggy flags that are that Embraer's default pipeline accepts. The, the, the compact build I mentioned is a default pipeline. Um, it, it because it's really like there for people to test all this stuff out. It has a bunch of flags like this where you could turn things off and turn things on and see the build at different stages. Um, so if I do a stage one only build, stage one is all about taking all your add-ons and um, compiling them into the the V2 format, um, and so. When this says building into blah, that's where it's going to put this stuff. So if I go look there, um, if I look inside there, all I have is a node modules folder because stage one is just all about set, like laying out my add-ons in the way I want them to be. Um, inside of node modules, I have like a bunch of different stuff. I have some sim links because that's the purple ones here. Um, because some of my dependencies didn't need to be rewritten. They were not add-ons that didn't need, they didn't need to get rewritten. And so that's just 20 back at my, back at my original node modules. But a lot of other stuff here did. So let's see. Um, what's a good example? Well, there's a few here. Uh, maybe uh, well, Ember Data, for example. So, so this is Ember Data after it has been compiled into uh, the new format. You know, we're down inside this deep temp directory because, of course, we're like on the fly, taking your whole app and all its add-ons and constructing a new version of them that, that is in this new world. This is really what the compatibility system is all about, right? Um, so if we look inside of Ember Data here, um, something that you might have imported from Ember Data would be like, well, if you just import from Ember Data, right, the top level, where would that file be, right? In Ember Data itself, it's like under add-on, because that's the convention inside of how add-ons are authored. But of course, we're, we need everything to follow node modules rules. So if you import from Ember Data, you're getting index.js in Ember Data, right? It, and, there, and it is therefore at index.js. That's where it is, right? We, move, we moved everything around so it's actually aligned with the node rules. There's no special, there's no difference between the build time path and the runtime path, which we used to have a distinction, right? Uh, in a traditional add-on, you have add-on index.js, which is what you, which is really your index.js at runtime, but it's not at build time, right? Now they're the same. Um, and there's a few other things that happen in this compile step. Like the big obvious one is the thing we just described there where 
I don't, I don't get rearranged. Um, if they do have a tree for app stuff, um, we, we capture that fact. We add metadata to them. Uh, I should do this actually in code, so it's really um, syntax added. Here's the, here's the rewritten package JSON for Ember data after it's been compiled. It's got the same stuff that was there before. This is all stuff that was there normally. But then it has this whole other section. Um, in the Ember add-on section, it says V2. This is opting it into being a, a new style add-on. And it is auto-upgraded. That's This is somewhat internal use by Embroider to say, this was authored in the old way, but we've auto-upgraded it to the new way. And when it's auto-upgraded, we're more lenient. We do a little more automatic fixing of stuff um, with the idea that once people actually publish natively, they should not need that fixing. They should actually have code that's correct. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff in here. Oh, and this is actually, this is going to be instructive because this is going to start to get into what the features like static add-on trees that I mentioned. Like, what is that and why does that matter? So implicit modules is a feature that says, this is all stuff in this add-on that if you use this add-on, you have to force them to be imported into the app. And there's a lot of them, right? And this is because like everything, this is everything that would have been included in a traditional Ember CLI build. You need all these files, right? And they're just going to all get pushed in automatically. Um, this is basically all of them, right? And then, um, and then we also have this thing, this is app.js. So this is, this is a directory full, this full of stuff that must be copied into the app, right? And meaning, uh, it's this stuff. So we've got app initializers, Ember data, instance initializers, Ember data. It's what was in the app folder before. Um, and this is like a very static way now. Before it was tree for app. It was a broccoli tree that could do arbitrary things. Now it's a static key in package JSON pointing to a static folder on disk. And what that means now is that like when stage two comes around to look at all these add-ons, it's very easy for it to see, okay, here's all the things that have app files. I need to copy those into my app so that that, and then that, basically gets rid of the whole app concept, app tree concepts before we hand off the webpack. So it's not making all these things very static. There's other stuff that goes on in the compile here that um, might be harder to find examples of, but um, if the if an add-on uses custom Babel transforms, like say maybe they're using um, a non-standard language feature, maybe they're maybe decorators right before de decorators is stabilized, and um, they're using that in their add-on, you're not using that in your apps, Babel, right? Today, that all works because add-ons bring their own whole Babel with them. They get to have their own Babel. They pick what version it is, and they set up all the plugins. And that is very flexible, but it's also very expensive because um, we can't just run one Babel build for the whole app and all its add-ons because everybody's got, not only does everybody have a different config, but the configs are not mutually compatible because a config written for Babel 7 won't work with Babel 6, right? And it, or it's certainly not Babel 5. So in today in Ember CLI, a lot of code go, and a lot of build time goes into letting everybody do their own thing with translation. Um, in the V2 spec, we don't allow that. The code that goes in the add-on must be only stable JavaScript features. And so as part of this compilation pass here, we would actually compile away any of the non-standard stuff. So we don't compile the standard things that are allowed in stable JavaScript. So classes are still there and like most of the modern JavaScript features are still there. Modules are still there. But anything weird, any weird Babel plugins actually get run in stage one, um, at least conceptually. Like, There's some hand-waving to do about how we could sometimes delay some of this work till a little later just to optimize. But conceptually, to be a V2 add-on, you, you only have standard JavaScript. And that also goes for your templates. So if your templates have custom transforms in them, um, those will run at stage one. And so your templates will be basically now pristine templates that don't need anything custom to compile them by the time we get to the next stage. So that's all work that goes on in this stage one. And how does that work as far as like um, different Ember apps? Like, because currently today I can go in and I can say, I can configure and say, I'm targeting these specific browsers, so I want Babel to optimize uh, my output based on yeah. the features that are available in those browsers. So how does that work yeah. in to what you just said? Um, so today, well, today the way it works is that each of those many babbles do, I believe, like as long as they're at newer than like six something of Ember CLI Babel, they all, all of those versions respect that shared target config. So it was a lot of work to make it everybody can respect it, and it meant like you didn't get the full benefit of the target file until you got all your add-ons up to a certain level of Babel. But now that we, now that most stuff is there. It generally works. Like all of the many babbles all look at that same target config and take it as input when they're compiling themselves in each add-on compiling itself. 
Um, so I guess, in the, I guess what I'm asking is, is sorry to interrupt. I guess what I'm asking is that it, um, the implication from what I gathered from what you said was that what is currently happening with this compatibility layer at some point yeah. is going to be happening prior to it being uploaded to NPM. So that would mean uh, yeah. it would happen after the Babel. Uh, right, so exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the only thing that you're required to do before uploading is non-standard plugins, right? Meaning things that are not in the ECMA spec like not stage four features or whatever, whatever I wrote in the spec. I don't remember what I wrote, but, but you know, the idea being that you're, you're, it is very modern JavaScript that you publish to NPM. It has most of the stuff in, right? Like the only things you would transpile are things that are not even stable, stable parts of JavaScript yet. Like it's on you to transpile those away um, because you, the, you're not obligating the rest of the system to know how to transpile your weird code. That's not standard JavaScript, right? But what you publish to NPM is, um, Bleeding edge, the newest standard version of JavaScript. So all the cool stuff is in there still. So like the code, that does mean that the app then is free to not transpile that and ship it, all of those features all the way out to modern browsers. Um, yes. And so that is, um, that is like you did get that kind of support already of add ons for the most part in uh, existing Ember 2. Um, I, Embraer does, I think, make it easier to do, um, multi, Target builds. That's not a thing I, I've easily set up to demo here, but um, like, I I think I want to make it part of the defaults to just build like have a legacy build and a modern browsers build, and use the there's a there's a known trick that gives you 100% reliability of getting serving the right bundle the right browser because basically you, you use your cutoff point as browsers that understand script type module or not. And then if you put a script type module that points at the brand new code for all browsers that know about that, and then a no module script tag, which will be for the old ones, it perfectly segregates the browsers. It's a known trick that only works this once at that one cut point, but that cut point happens to be a really good one. Like browsers that know about modules also know about a ton of the stuff that you otherwise have to transpile. So um, making that kind of thing part of the standard build is like, I would like to do it. I just haven't yet. Um, and Today, uh, today you do get most, like today, if you write in your targets file, a very modern thing, you do get a very modern build of all your add-ons and your app. Um, Ember itself isn't quite as, as, um, compilable at build time, partly because it tries to pre-build a lot of things for performance of the build, but then, like, it does have to make some choices before it gets to your target list. Um, Ember does ship with multiple, ver multiple versions of the build to try to, like, give you most of the flexibility, like there is a pretty modern pre-compiled version for modern browsers that pre that ships inside of Ember source. Um, but um, a nice thing that is going to, I talked before about how a lot of the optimization kind of work that you could do now that, that you could have done before, you probably weren't motivated to do it because it didn't really help you that much because you didn't have a build system to take advantage of it. Now that you have a build system to take advantage of it, I think it motivates a lot of other projects like for example, making sure that Ember itself ships as a as a whole bunch of loose uncompiled modules um, to NPM, right? Actually, like now it would be really nice. Like now it, we'd have a system that would take advantage of it. Now you would actually have a system that um, if you don't import something out of Ember, it, that something doesn't go into your build, right? That is huge, and it's not really a thing that is the way. It's not how Ember ships yet. Um, it's not because, not even because there's a ton of work to make that happen. Like it's some work. Uh, but mostly, like, the work was thankless when there was not a build system to take advantage of it, right? Now it's not so thankless. Like, now if you did the, if you did a PR to make one small chunk of Ember, uh, actually only import when needed, everybody would benefit right away. As soon as, you know, once we've got this kind of build system. So, um, we do want to make things like Ember's own, Ember's own builds, uh, expose, basically be a more normal add-on, expose all these modules the same way that other add-ons do, so that, so that your target config can control them. And not just your target config, but so that your app's own usage can tree shake out the pieces of Ember that it isn't using. Right. Um, that doesn't really work yet because of the way Ember is structured internally. But, um, there's, but we've designed the module imports so that all your app code is structured so that it's just a re, it's just re, just refactoring work, right? It doesn't, it's not breaking changes to make it so that when you import, you know, a route, uh, that's what actually pulls the routing part of Ember in. And if you wanted to just render a component and never have any routes, you would, you would get a, th a thing built that doesn't have a router. And like, you could just do a web component that's Ember-based. Like Glimmer.js kind of was the technology demo of that. 
we're basically getting there now. Like we have, we already have glimmer components as a standalone thing that don't need, they don't depend on, uh, you know, if you do the octane preview, you can already author glimmer components, right? Um, they don't need all of the old Ember object system stuff. They don't use it. And so they don't import it. And if you were building them with Embroider, and you would actually only pull in a small amount of code to get those components to render. So it gets us, it really, we're, we're really getting there now on the, on the vision of like, be able to, to smoothly move between the small and the big, right? I, knowing that like a sweet spot for Ember apps is that they can grow to be very, very feature rich apps that tend to grow a lot of features and be big. Um, but it's nice for people to be able to start small and feel like they get that win too. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I can show, um, so anyway, that was talking about stage one, which is just our, our, um, add ons. I want to show, um, a thing that I'll show before I move on to stage two is just what happens when we change static add on stuff. Right. If we, if these are the first two options that we turned on before, right? Static, we, we made the trees static. Um, if we then go and build this again, again, a stage one only build, and we'll see what's different about it. Uh, mostly you remember there was that big long list of implicit modules and that's implicit modules is document as part of spec. It's basically a way to declare that if anybody uses my add on, they're forced to import all this stuff on and, um, now we turn that off. So node modules, Ember data. So now, uh, if I look at that same file, it doesn't have all those implicit modules anymore. They're gone. And that's because we've said like, we're not going to implicitly in include anything anymore. It's just, if they get imported by some file, they'll get imported. If they don't, they won't be there. So this is an example of where you can see the Really, the, um, these, these optimization flags we've been turning on, they don't do more work, they do less work, because all of them are turning off compatibility features, getting us down to the world where everything is just aligned with regular module import semantics. So let's move on to stage two. Um, and uh, yeah, let's do stage two only build. And um, so stage two, of course, is going to take all these add-ons that have now been like nicely pre-digested for us. And actually, I'm going to do stage two with with the static stuff still off, um, just because it's also interesting to see there the impact. So stage two is going to it's it's able to take advantage of all the work we already did in stage one. So when it needs an add-on, it knows how to find stuff, right? Like if you if somebody says import blah from add-on, we know exactly where to go get that on disk. It's actually resolvable using the normal NPM rules. So any kind of custom broccoli trees it had don't matter anymore. Um, and so that gives us a lot of power to, to know where things are and be able to write imports for them. Um, so now in, I, in my app here, there's a lot more stuff. I still have my, my node modules folder that we had before with all the add-ons in it, but now we've added to it the, the, the rewritten version of the app. And just like in the uh, add-ons, we've aligned the import paths with the real path. So if you were, you, then, you know, the actual runtime import for the, like the module specifier for a component in your app is normally like your app name slash components slash the, the component name, right? But when you author that, you author it as app slash components slash whatever. And so that's, again, an example of where they don't align this compiler pass has taken that away. So now like, there's no distinction anymore. Um, we have a, um, we have an index.html, which I'll open up. Now, of course, this was based off of the original index.html that was in the, in the original authored app. Um, it's got things like, uh, let me, well, it's got like the, the meta, the meta field, which is a traditional thing every CLI does. Like that has already run now. Like this is an example of, Again, we're trying to compile away all the emberisms to the point where the next system down, like we're going to hand to Webpack next. It doesn't know about where Ember puts its meta field, right? So it's already done. That work is done. Like the meta's in. Um, and then we've got like, we've got a style sheet that's pointing at the vendor. We've got, um, these are the, actually the two, two style sheets you would have already had. Um, our style handling is not very radical. Um, 
the system can do like module oriented styles, but all of, none of the legacy stuff is that. So this is really just kind of doing what it already did with styles. Um, and let's see, this is actually, this stuff actually got inserted by an add on. And then we get, uh, we have assets vendor and assets super rentals. So right now this is starting to look kind of normal. Like, like this is kind of what you'd expect an Ember app to have a vendor and like a vendor and an app JS. Um, although our app JS says type module. Um, so this is because, um, we really do care about the distinction between script context and module context for things to be correct. Like our vendor JS is script context. Our, our app is not like this is actually, um, this is saying this is, this is a JavaScript module. You should treat it as one. And JavaScript modules are allowed to import other JavaScript modules. Um, so that, that is, again, that's us leveraging existing standards, meaning in this case, HTML is a standard. It has a very, it has, there's, there's a very well specified meaning for what this means when you see, say, script type equals module. That's the API that we use to pass to the stage three. It would, now we should look at what is in this file because that is where we've synthesized the app entry point. So, um, so this is like the, the entry point that we synthesized and it's going to have a lot of stuff in it because I had the static add on trees off. Um, I, and, uh, you'll notice before when I mentioned about app size, I said, as long as you get to th get the optimization stages turned on, it's definitely smaller. At the very most compatible stage, your app might get a little bit bigger because of this compatibility code. It's not like measurably bigger a lot, but it's, there's, there's some extra code in here to, to wed everything together. Um, what you see here is, um, we have, uh, we have this, the thing that we've imported and called R just for brevity here, uh, because this is like machine generated code that's only for the compiler to read, right? But, um, this is a, this is a build time require. Uh, so it would be, it would be an import, except import doesn't handle the case we need here, which is, it needs, it's, um, dynamic, but, uh, synchronous. Right. There's no dynamic and synchronous JavaScript import, but we do have this, um, require, which works just like AMD require or nodes CGS require. So like what it does is pretty, it's the same thing, but it's intended to have a meaning at build time. Um, and D is our actual window define. This is the classic define that appears inside of built Ember apps. This is talking about the AMD loader, the loader JS AMD define. So, what we're doing is defining runtime names. These things on the left are runtime names, the things that Ember might choose to require at runtime. And the things on the right are the build time paths to those things. And this is lining them all up. And it's lining them up in a way because they've, they've got functions because like we don't actually go and run the code on the right hand side until somebody requires the thing on the left hand side. So you can see there's a ton of stuff in here and it includes things from the add-ons and from the app itself. And some of the things from the app itself are actually from the add-ons because again, we have tree for add-on, right? Um, a thing we didn't say explicitly when we we're looking here is that like if we look in super rentals initializers, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Some of it could have been from this app, but I think it's mostly from add-ons, right? Because tree for add -on, tree, tree for app is the feature where add-ons copy code into the app. Well, that copy has already happened because now those files are just in the app, right? So, Again, this, it had to be so because we don't want to teach Webpack what tree for app means. We just say these are actually files in the app. So they're literally copied into the app. And that's why we had to rewrite the app in the first place into this new location. Right? So like the Ember data initializer is here inside of the app slash initializers. Here it is, right? Um, so that's an example of we've already run that code. We've, we've compiled away that Emberism. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here. And that's because this is all being driven mostly by that implicit imports thing, we, uh, implicit modules thing we talked about. Um, and then at the end, we literally like tell the app to boot. Um, and this is when we require this app file, that is just the app file that you've actually authored in, you know, app, app JS. That is the one. Um, like it's not changed or anything. Like it's this file that you all have in your Ember apps today, right? That's what needed to boot it. So like, okay, pretty straightforward, right? So what we needed to, is it ends up kind of being kind of boring, actually. Hopefully it's like, like, define the modules that are needed, and then boot the app. Um, so, but then this again shows you the impact of going to static stuff. Um, if we turn this stuff static again, we're gonna have less there. And let's, um, this is worth looking at because it's slightly, it's gonna be slightly different than what we looked at before. Um, so let's do again a stage two only build. Now we have, 
static analysis of all the add-on trees. So we're going to get a lot less stuff in there. Um, but the things that remain are going to be interest, are going to be interesting because then we're going to get rid of them next with the next layer of optimization. So code assets super rentals JS. Here's our entry point again. Now it has a lot less stuff in it, um, like by a lot. Um, the things that remain are let's see. Well, we've got initializers. Um, this is an example of like. There's not really a way to ever shake initializers out. Like by virtue of existing, they're supposed to run, so they're always getting put into here. Um, we've got uh, let's see, we've got some we got components. So we've got like the list filter component, the location map component. These are coming out of the app. Um, we've got their templates, right? We've got helpers. I think these are probably all from the app itself. I don't think they're they're uh, add-on ones. Um, We've got um, controllers and routes, right, all in here. Uh, and then that's it. And then we tell the app to boot. So the next stage then, of course, is to turn on static ev everything, right? Static helpers, true. Static components, true. And do this build again. Uh, stage two only. This temporary directory that we're looking in, even if I didn't say stage two only, if I let the build go the whole way, it would still, the temporary directory has the same stuff because it's basically the temp there is done after stage two. Um, if we're just saving that, like we're not waiting for Webpack to actually then run stage three. The main benefit is just making it go faster right now. We would see the same content in here if I let the build finish. Because um, once this is written, this is now the input to Webpack, which does whatever it does and then dumps the output into dist. So, now let's see our updated input. Um, so it's it's smaller. It's hard for you probably to see, but there's no more components in here actually, um, none at all, uh, and there's no helpers in here at all. And so the question then is, well, like, well, how did the how do the components and helpers end up in the app, right? Um, and so that takes us to well, how should a component or helper get in the app? It should get in if some template that's in the app used it, right? And so we have the route templates are in here still. Like this is the rentals index route template, right? Um, we can go and like, you can go and look at that template. It's sitting here on disk. It's um, templates rentals index. It's still just HBS at this point, um, which is deliberate. Like we're trying to actually convey as much information all the way till the end as possible and have very global visibility into this thing. Um, and so this still didn't really answer the question, right? Like, how do we know then to get these things imported? Where does that happen? So by the time we get to stage two, we have not run, um, the final like Babel pass and template compiler pass of all this stuff that happens inside of stage three. Meaning like when you set a webpack, you say for all your job, all the JavaScript files use this Babel config for all the HBS files use the template compiler, excuse me, use the template compiler. Um, the configuration of those compilers is sitting here on disk. Um, inside of the compiled app, again, to make it really easy for people to write the stage three. So the compiled app also has this extra metadata in it. You can see that um, this one is of type app version two. It has assets, um, which meaning, meaning these are things that absolutely need to have URLs in the final output. Um, it includes our index.html, but also things like things that were in public. Um, so like that's, we, we, we've explicitly told the stage three, like, Please make sure each of these things has a URL in the final net app. We have information about how to do the template compilation. Um, there's a file name that actually tells you where the template compiler that's been built into this app is. And it's parallel safe in this case, meaning you, it's safe to use this file in a, in a new process. You don't have to do it in the one that we, we made it in. Um, that's not always true. That's actually why I, at the beginning of this talk, said that I upgraded Ember CLI template lint. Basically, we can do the parallel thing if all of your AST transforms and all of your Babel plugins are expressed in a declarative way that is portable across node processes. If that's true, well, then we get these parallel configs, which is nice because then we could optimize. Um, and we have a similar one for Babel here. Like the Babel config is sitting here in this file. It is parallel safe. It's major version seven. And um, 
So, and like we know the root URL that this app is going to be served under. This is the same meaning that it has in every CLI. Uh, we can look at that template compiler. Maybe it's not super interesting, but it's basically like what, what you need to know here is that this is when, when we go and when so we want to actually implement stage three, this just exports a function that has built into it all the config that's needed to compile templates in this app. So this is like exports a compile function, but you don't need to know anything else about Ember to use it. Uh, and the Babel config is, it's just a Babel config, but it's all there ready to go for you. Like a Babel config with all of your plugins and all their configs. And some of the config here is provided by Embroider itself because we have some internal Babel plugins that do critical things to patch over incompatibilities. An example of that um, is, so here is an, a good example. So today, when you use QUnit in an Ember app in your test, you um, you don't really use add QUnit to your dependencies. You add Ember QUnit to your dependencies, and it gives you a QUnit to import. Right? You say import from QUnit, but you don't ever actually add like npm install QUnit, right? So there's a mismatch. We're not. This is a case where that is import semantics don't match the, the real node ones. And you could get away with that stuff in tr the traditional way Ember apps build because it was all just a runtime thing. Like any, any NPM package could pretend to be any other. But we don't want that anymore. We want to actually follow the rules every time. So we have some compatibility stuff like this. And in this case, it's telling us um, if you see somebody trying to import from here, it really means import from here. Right. And we've done the rewriting of the system so that like down inside of the Ember QUnit package now, there is the copy of that stuff in the right place. And so this is in the Babel config because when, when the Babel pass is actually running on all of the JavaScript files in this app, if they see somebody trying to import from QUnit, they're going to dynamically rewrite that import to Ember QUnit and make it all align with the rules again. Because that's down inside our Babel config, we've, we've hidden all that away from Webpack. Right? We've, we've dealt with it. Um, and there's other stuff in here like that too. Like whole packages renaming. Lodash here is another good example. Um, Ember Lodash provides Lodash, similar kind of thing. In this case, um, it's a whole package rename, so it's in a different section. This is individual file renames. This is whole packages. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's like, you know, here's the presets that came out of our targets list, right? Again, having a config target set JS is an Ember convention. It's not a convention that like, it's just our convention, but we don't need to teach that convention to stage three if we give it a pre-configured Babel config that already has it in here, right? which is great. To show the last bit, which is how we get the, the, how do we actually get our helpers and components in, what I really need to do to show you that is actually run this Babel and the template compiler against some of the files in here. Um, and I have a manual way to do that. Like, when it actually runs, when we do the build, it actually happens inside a webpack. Like those files don't ever end up on disk in the transpiled form, right? Like it reads the files that we're seeing, like the HVS here that we just, that this HVS. Um, and it runs the template compiler over it and gets JavaScript. And then that's the JavaScript that webpack then takes as its input and processes the hell out of, right? And compiles away all the import statements into other things and stuff. So to see the import statements, we actually need to catch that intermediate state. We need to run the, um, run the template compiler ourselves, which we can do. So I'm going to do that just to show what goes on. And I think this this um, this route template was a good example, actually. So let's open it up. Um, so this was one of the templates that are actually a route template. And so this one was included explicitly into the, the build results, right? And so that's there's like actually a statement in the entry point of the app, the super rentals here for that, right? It's like here, we've defined it. We define super rentals templates rentals index as please require this file, right? And it's an HBS file. Um, that means like when Webpack encounters that, it's going to say, okay, I need to grab the HBS file. How do I load HBS files? Oh, I use the template compiler. So let's run the template compiler and see what Webpack will see with the output. Um, I have, let's see, um, node, writer. I literally just wrote this little utility before this talk because I knew I wanted to show this stuff. Um, manual HBS, and we need to give it the template compiler. Temp come on, let's see. Template compiler and the where is it? The templates, yes. 
rental uh, man is off screen. Too long. Cannot see. Templates, rentals, index. It's just, okay, there we go. Thank you for bearing with me. I just made this hack work. Um, .js. Okay. So this is the compiled template. Um, this part is what Ember already normally does. Uh, let me actually just toggle the line wrapping. Toggle work. Um, this is what Ember always does when it compiles templates. If you see what they look like in the compiled output, it is this. This is the wire format of a template. Um, it is important that it happens like pretty late in the game because the wire format can differ per Ember version. So like, we definitely don't want add-ons to do this before they publish to NPM. They have to give us HBS. HBS is the stable format. But this wire format is what actually goes out to like browsers. So that part is normal. But before it, you see this other stuff. You see, um, and remember, uh, to compare, let's see, we were looking at, um, this is the original I'll put on the left. Yes, okay, I'll close this. Right, so on the left is uncompiled, on the right is the compiled. Um, you'll see that this, this template uses a list filter component. On the right hand side, we import the list filter HBS and the list filter, and we define it as a runtime name that Ember will see. And we import the JavaScript file and we define it. And so it means that on demand, like just in time, if you try to use and import this route template, we're gonna import and define all of the templates and all of the other components and helpers that it uses. Um, and so list filter is in here. Uh, also rental listing, yeah, rental listing is the other component. You see we're invoking a rental listing component here. And lo and behold, we are importing rental listings, template, and JavaScript here, and defining them just in time before we actually provide this template out. So what this means is every template gets this behavior, right? And this, um, these, these things are, are context sensitive. Like they, they actually go find the right files on disk. Like if you only have an HBS, it knows to do the right thing and not include the JS too, right? Make sure that they actually all align. Um, and since every template gets this behavior now, the full graph of dependencies is represented entirely in entirely in a way that is just JavaScript that now Webpack can see, right? So, um, and helpers would be the same. If there was a helper in here, uh, you would get to import it this way too. And so, and of course, when you follow this link, like to list filter HBS, it's another template that compiled this way and it imports more things the same way your JavaScript does, right? So that's the answer to how does stuff get into the build. Um, once you're running in this, in this static mode, as long as we can find all of the things, they get compiled into your as import statements and the whole build works. And that's, and that's the secret that makes all the rest work because once you have this, now, um, there's no, there's no code that implements the tree shaking. Tree shaking is just only use the things that get pulled on. And this is what does the pulling. Uh, so the system is always tree shaking as just an inherent nature of the system. The only reason we, you know, it's just that we actively defeat the tree shaking when we're in the most compatible mode by Kind of um, out of paranoia, pre including everything because we just want to be absolutely sure we're compatible, um, so that we don't miss any of the cases. Because like obviously this only works if we don't miss any cases, right? Which leads you to the question of like what happens in the dynamic cases, things like component this dot custom header or something, right? That's the cases where we'd need to go into the rule system and things. And this case would like, Embroider would generate a warning for this case and tell you, I don't know if it's safe. There's like a, there's a dynamic thing here. You have to give me a rule that tells me where it comes from. Um, and so there is a way to do that. That stuff's all getting actively developed. You can, there are rules already included in the, um, in Embroider for some, some common things. Um, it may be interesting to actually look at some. Um, I could show you, for example, that, um, so Ember Power Select is a great example of a very popular add-on. People use it. People should use it. It's like definitely good. You don't want to write yourself. It makes it easier to get your accessibility right. That's a, it's a perfect example of why we have add-ons. Um, it has some very dynamic stuff in it, though. And if I show you the rules, that'll help me figure out what the dynamic stuff is. Um, power Select. So this file is rules about Power Select that Embroider knows. And 
this is totally like, and in the realm of compatibility hacking, um, like having metadata in Embroider that's about other packages, right, is definitely somewhat fragile, right? It means if power like changes, it won't necessarily match. This system is smart enough to be up to like keep to follow along. Like you can say this is actually valid for like two X or something like that. Um, but you know, this is like this is the kind of stuff that actually lets us test full traversal of apps without having holes by plugging the holes without having to go upstream and fix the add-ons and or change or break, force them to have breaking changes to their own APIs. Um, so I think it's important that we have these kind of compatibility scaffolding. Um, an example of um, where we need these kind of rules is that let's look at the power select component itself. Um, So it has um, a bunch of dynamic component usage like this, where it, it, it takes a trigger, com it has a trigger component, right? It's going to render. When our compiler sees this, it's like, well, I don't know what to import. How do I know I, this component is present? It might just crash at runtime because I'm missing that component. So you would initially get a warning about that, and you have to say, where the heck does trigger component come from? Um, but we do have a rule for the car set component that says um, it accepts components as arguments, Trigger component is an argument that it accepts. And now that means we know that um, we've accounted for this. We know that the, where it comes from is it comes in as an argument to power select. What that means is that when people, when somebody else calls power select and passes in trigger component at trigger component equals, the compiler will see that point and say, all right, can I identify this component? If I can't, I'm going to put the warning there and tell them I can't tell what this is. Or if they, if they've put a string literal, then we can see what it is. Or if they've put the component helper with a string letter, we can see what it is. And so we can synthesize the correct input. So in this way, the idea is to make rules about flow so that um, we can actually trace these hard cases. And again, most components are not the hard cases. Like the component helper is used in very frameworky kind of places. There's a few key places in these kind of very, very powerful generic add-ons that use it, uh, which is why it's good to have the shared rules in one place. Um, there's other kinds of rules too, like some some components yield other components out, and that and it's safe. They're accounted for. Um, there's also cases where like so the JavaScript file in this case. Um, let's see, power select dot yes. Um, it implicitly depends on some things. Like uh, here we go. So um, there's a bunch of arguments that power select takes for optional optional components that you can customize. And if you don't provide one, it has its own default. This is an example of there's a, there's an, there's an argument called before options component, and you can pass that in, and it's probably even listed here in, a, in the rules. Uh, before options is oh no, sorry, that's uh, here. Yes. So power select takes before options component as an argument. So if you if we see somebody passing an argument in there, we try to zoom in and say, can we tell what component that is, and generate a warning if we can't. Um, but if nobody passes one in, it's going to Power Select is going to use the default one, and this is its name. It's called Power Select slash Before Options. The problem is if now we didn't know about that, and if if um, we just ran this code and didn't have this rule, it tries to find at runtime this component, Power Select Before Options, and we don't have an import for it, and it breaks. Right. And so the thing that we needed to express is that this file we're looking at here, because it has the name of this component in it, it actually has a dependency on that component, an unstated dependency on that component. Now. A more clear way to do this would be um, once it is based on the current set of RFCs out there, it is we're working to the point where any component is safe to import and then pass around as a value and use. That's not strictly true today because of the need to associate the template and the component together. Um, like there's a reason that all add-on components have to do this hack where they import their own template and set it as their layout. And if, that makes them safe to re-export and, and pass around. But in general, components are not safe to pass around as values. We're trying to fix that right now in Ember because if we do, a lot of these kind of APIs can actually become an explicit import. Instead of having a string that is the name of a component here, you would actually import that component here explicitly as an import statement and set it, set it as a value here. And then there would be no hole, right? Then if every time you access this the component, we know you depend on the other component. It, it creates the edges in the dependency graph. Um, but so this is an example where today we don't explicitly import that component. We just say its name. And so we have rules in here that say that file, powerslug.js, it depends on these components. 
you can't tell by looking at it that it does. You can't reliably analyze that it does. I mean, a human looking at it can tell, but like a static anal- analysis cannot tell without running the code that which component is going to need. So we have a rule here. And that this is enough for us. This also, like when we compile PowerSelect.js, just like we saw in the template, when, we, when Babel compiles this JavaScript, it actually figures out what import statements to put at the top to get to make sure these components are included. And that closes the holes, and that lets you actually traverse the whole dependency graph. Uh, and once you're traversing the dependency graph, that's what gets us to our final cool feature, which was the route splitting. So let's show what the code looks like when we do the route splitting, and that would be probably a good place to wrap up uh, the demo. Um, so let's... Uh, hey, just one second. We've got a question here. Sure. So can you define those rules in your app space for your own app? Unique yes. That's, yes. Yes. That's- yeah, definitely. It's actually an argument right here. Um, you can you can you can set rules um, for like you know if you if you added some add-on and realized that it needed rules, like you could say weird add-on, you know, um, and uh, or like your own app codes, like well, I have app codes. Oh yes, and I'll, yeah, absolutely, your own app code, and that could also be your app here, you know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. You could say you know you could say your app here component foo. Um, and when you name the component, it's actually like the invocation syntax. Like that's the reliable way to name a component because that's how people know to name components. And you can say that this actually, you know, takes uh, component arguments or something, except component arguments like trigger, right? So now it's like we know that it's safe that if we see component curly curly component trigger, we know that's safe. But if, when somebody calls foo, when somebody else writes at foo trigger equals blah, we'll say, Hey, wait, warning, what is blah? And then if they change, if they, if they change it to say this, we know the answer. That's, a, that's statically analyzable. We know that's component blah. If they change it to say this, we know that's safe. It's still component blah. We can see all those cases. But if they just say like, if they say this dot blah, that's going to be a warning. Unless maybe now in their component, they have to say, Oh, I also accepted that as an argument. Blah is an argument. Pass the buck. Make, make somebody else know who actually did that, right? So yes, we can do that stuff. Um, all, and there's actually another kind of compatibility thing you can add in here that I'm not going to go into the details of, but it's, it's lower level. It's very powerful. It lets you basically rewrite any add-on in any arbitrary way if it's doing something that's broken and, for, and it's preventing you from moving forward. Um, it's, it's, it's called compat adapters, and you could put compat adapters in here that basically provide arbitrary broccoli code to like six broken things in add-ons. I don't, it's not a thing I hope people need to use, like going forward. If you're like an early adopter and you're trying to like really get your app to build regardless of what's broken in your add ons and you don't want to wait for them to fix, it's very helpful to be able to move forward and test. So that's why I needed it. Um, and there are compact adapters built into Embroider for common things. For example, Ember Data itself, um, has a very customized and weird build step where it reuses rollups and that actually hides all the details from Embroider and breaks some things. So we actually just use, have a, simple compat adapter that neuters that whole step and just turns it off and that actually makes Ember data work fine. Um, so anyway, all of these, all of those things are like things we want to fix upstream. And some of them are like some of the things we fix are broken enough that we're already making PRs to fix them. Like just invalid JavaScript that accidentally worked under the old module loader. Other things are going to run away till we have a stable V2 add on spec, like high on my to-do list is to make that be an official RFC to the point where we can get community consensus around it, get that RFC merge. And at that point, we can have some confidence that add-ons that ship natively as this new format will be stable and supported. And um, that's a thing that, that'll even benefit people who aren't even on Embroider yet because it just makes the add-ons do less work, right? Um, and it simplifies the add-ons. And that's really how we want to avoid needing any of these kind of compatibility adapters or um, even the package, the package rules Package rules we might need for a while until Ember itself has closed all these holes, basically. Um, and like, even when we do, it will mean changing the APIs. And so it would force, for example, PowerSelect, um, a newer, more bulletproof version of PowerSelect would error if you tried to pass a string in as one of those custom components, right? Today it accepts a string. So that would be a breaking change. We wouldn't want to force that immediately to happen, right? It'd be very un- annoying. So. We just know we're going to need these kind of compatibility systems around long enough to let people move along. I do think, um, like once we get an RFC for the new add-on format, I think add-on authors are going to be very excited to get their stuff simplified. And, and every add-on that goes to the new format um, makes the builds of all the apps that use it faster.
let's look at how we do route splitting. Um, let's actually just split about. So we'll be one to look at. Um, so this means like the route about and any child routes um, are going to be split out of the main bundle and be in their own bundle. Um, and let's look at what that output looks like. You know, we, we're examining the stage two output because that's really where we've we've done the interesting work to get all of the emerisms compiled down to JavaScript. And after that, you can kind of look at the JavaScript and say, uh, I see that this is JavaScript in like a, in a new enough browser that actually did, like supported everything, supported modules. You can imagine adding a tiny amount of config just so that it knows how to do module loading for our, all the packages, and um, probably pre-running the template compiler on all the template stuff. And then you wouldn't actually need a stage three. Like stage three could be just use the platform, right? If if you in theory, if you had a browser that actually understands dynamic import, import all the module loading, all of these features, you don't need a stage three. And it's actually would the app would run. It would actually boot and run without a stage three. So like that's kind of a powerful idea. Even if it's never practical to ship apps that way, it's nice to know that the semantics at the beginning of like at the end of stage two are actually still a complete valid application that follows the spec. Right. That's how you know that stage three is really just about optimizing what's there and making sure it keeps running correctly. Um, so, and so we haven't even mostly been examining the output of stage three because it's not super interesting. It's just whatever optimization that Webpack chose to do. I mean, it's interesting if you're trying to like tweak the settings, but it's not super relevant to our purposes right here, which was actually just getting us to that front door where we can then play with all those optimizations, uh, which was the hard part. So. Let's open up our main entry point again. Um, and so uh, it looks pretty similar, but we have some extra stuff at the end. And we've removed a few things. So like before, we would have had the, the like we have route files for the other routes, but we don't for about anymore. It got removed from this list. Um, it's not here anymore. So we're not going to load that code, meaning like the, the template for it and the route file for it and the controller for it if it's got one. All of those um, got removed from here. They won't load, um, and which means because they were also because of the component traversal and temp template traversal we've been talking about, it also means that any components and templates that were getting pulled in by that router also dropped, right? Because we've pruned off that whole branch of the tree just by leaving out the top level entry point. So now anything that's only used on about is no longer in the list. Instead, we just have a little bit of metadata here uh, that says like if you're trying to load this route. Here's the code, here's the function that does it. And all it is is a dynamic import statement. This is standard JavaScript. Maybe you haven't used it yet, but it's, this is, this is a, uh, ECMA module standard thing for doing a dynamic import. It's just like static import at the top of a file, but it returns a promise because it's going to do it at runtime or it's going to do it, um, asynchronously, like dynamically when it, when this load function happens and not before, right? So. What this means is Webpack will see this and it knows that we, we might eventually load this file because we might call this function, but it doesn't know when. So it's not going to include all that JavaScript in the initial bundle, right? And this file, of course, is something that we've also synthesized. So let's go see what that looks like. Routes about. It looks a lot like the other one, but now this is just the entry points for that, that route. And in this case, the about route has a template and a route file. It doesn't happen to have a controller or that would be here too. And you can see that then this is going to pull in the other things, right? So now about that HBS, when that gets compiled, it's going to import all the components that are needed on this route, and they're going to be there. And and as I said before, when we were talking about optimizing, Webpack's going to see what components are there, but it also sees what components are needed on the other routes, and it'll know if you've already got some, and it'll make decisions about whether to include it in two bundles or not, or, you know, oh, we know you've already got that one. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and, you know, same, same, of course, for like the route file. If the route file imports some library, of course, you're not, you're only going to get it now when you dynamically load that route file, right? So maybe you, um, your, if, whether it's your route or your controller or a, or a component JavaScript, right? Maybe about.hvs uses a component. The component has a JavaScript file. The JavaScript file imports lodash, right? All of that only gets pulled in now when we do this load of this entry point, when that dynamic, uh, load function runs, right? And so um, the embroider router, you can imagine, it's not that complicated. It just looks at this metadata here, and every time you're entering a route, it says, oh, I have a load function for that that I haven't called yet, so I'll just call it. And that's it. And then this, 
this compiles to whatever Webpack chooses to do with it. It'll go and fetch the bundles. And if it, if it realizes it already has the bundles, it won't do anything. It'll just return the, the code, answer, the code right away. Right. Um, and that's it. So like that was route splitting is that synthesizing those like few lines. Um, so you see that most of the work to do the feature, um, is really the foundational layers that align all the primitives correctly. And once they're aligned correctly, the actual implementation of route splitting is like a tiny amount of code. Um, like it's a little bit you see that got generated here. And you can imagine generating this isn't that hard. Like once you, it's really just because finding all the stuff is now also easy, right? Knowing that this route only has like, where would its template and route be? There's only one possible place on disk that it could be. You don't have to run a bunch of broccoli trees to find out where they came from because we've already done all of that, right? It's all resolvable already. The only possible place that these files could be is where they are. And so we can easily look for them and synthesize these, these defined statements and that's it. So that is the kind of under the hood of how all this stuff works. In development, the way Webpack chooses to do source maps. Uh, so well, you, you will note that um, at the end of stage two, right, stuff wasn't comp wasn't transpiled. Um, it's all still in the nice format. So what Webpack sees as input is, is basically untranspiled stuff. Meaning, when you run Webpack and you tell it to use source maps, it it source maps all the way back to to the code you authored, for the, like pretty much all the time. Um, it would miss, yeah, no, nothing basically. It'll transpile all the way back. So um, the way it does it, it's a different strategy than um, Ember uses. Um, it has some pros and cons. It's actually very fast. Um, they use an eval-based thing by default uh, in dev, in dev only. Um, let's go find uh, an example of this stuff. So when you look at the compiled output of one of these chunks, uh, let's look at our actual app code maybe. Let's see, adapters application, sure. Okay, here's components list filter JS. Um, like this is the, 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 the compiled, um, babble, compiled webpack output that has this thing. And it actually is, um, we're in the middle of like a big, uh, list, I guess. It's like a list where there's like the name and then after that comes like a, a closure that returns the value of the actual module. And so like, uh, components list filter here. When somebody needs it at runtime, they're going to hit this code. And then it, it, this is it's a, all the code for that module. The compiled code is actually in this big eval statement. Um, reading it is annoying then, of course, but you, you would think. But the, the nice thing is that that um, actually contains the source map inside of it. Oh, I don't have the server running. Let's see, Ember serve. Um, If I put a breakpoint there, though, we can step right into it, and you'll see that if you actually break in your own code, you have the original source map. And that's, that's why they're using the eval strategy, because the, the evals can have their own source maps embedded in them. And then um, you don't need to have one massive concatenated source map. Concatenating source maps is expensive um, and annoying. Having written some of that code for Ember CLI myself, it was hard and full of bugs, because it's very hard to get right. Um, that, let's see, that component's used where? On the home page, maybe, or let's see. This one, I don't know. Oh, do I have my source maps turned off, maybe? No. I don't know. I was trying to break on one to show you what it looks like. Well, actually, here, we should just go into our app. Now that we have the server running, of course, we can we can edit our app in live, live code, right? Like, we should be able to do that. Uh, let's filter component. Let's, uh, let's put a debugger statement in init and see where we end up. In the browser, are you able to like command search for a file name like you could before, or do you have to have a link? Yeah. To oh yeah, no, yeah, you can. Um, so like this, um, this is it. Like you can see, I'm actually it actually knows that it's called list filter JS, and it's got pretty close to the original source. You can see there's definitely a little like the import statements have been munged. Um, it's not too bad. Um, I'm actually surprised it didn't go quite all the way back. Maybe there's something to tweak there to show the import statements too. But um, it's pretty close. And yes, you can find it by name. Like this is actually list filter JS, right? It, you could find them also um, in here. Uh, it actually does a pretty good job. Like there's, they're actually all in namespace under the Webpack protocol here. I don't know if you can see the bottom corner of my screen. It's kind of far down, but um, in here you can actually see like navigate all the files. Like I can go to templates, components location map HPS and find them. Um, 
some of these are things that, well, like, cause this is, these are templates, right? So this is the compiled output actually. So you actually, we looked at, um, we looked at some of these examples. Like this is, remember we showed the compiled template and we had synthesized imports. Now these imports have been compiled into web packages at this layer, right? Um, you can, you can see that compiled output here. So I guess the, we're not getting source mapping on, um, on HPS right now. That would be nice. Should figure that out. Yeah. So anyway, there is source mapping. It's not, it's not bad. Um, yeah.